Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a discovery of a very strange white dwarf star. The star that didn't really make sense until the scientists tried to explain its origins. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Man. And I wanted to start our adventure today right here on Earth but also by looking in the night skies and seeing one of the brightest stars in the night skies, which is Sirius A. It's actually right there, this is the bright white star you see. But the thing is what a lot of people don't realize is that it's actually not one but two stars, and its partner is extremely extremely small and very very dim. In order for us to actually try to discern the partner, we have to start zooming into the star as if we had a telescope and wanted to see what's up there in this region. And so here, once I start zooming in, and actually this right here is a global cluster known as Gaia, you'll start discerning another shape somewhere near it. And there you go. So this is the partner Sirius A and Sirius B. And Sirius B is essentially the closest white dwarf star to us. And the reason why it's interesting is because it's somewhat similar to what we just discovered, although the white dwarf we just found is actually even weirder. So if I were to jump to Sirius B right now, this is kind of what it would look like. This is a star that's really bright, but is no longer technically a star. This is what's known as a remnant. And furthermore, this is technically the core of the star that used to exist in this region, and the total size of this object is approximately the same size as our planet Earth. But the mass of the object is very close to our Sun, actually approximately 2% more massive than our Sun. So imagine this really dense, really massive object with a relatively small size. Now because this is the remnant of the star, it doesn't actually have any nuclear reaction on the inside and all of the heat produced is essentially the leftovers from when this used to be a star. So it's technically really 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 slowly cooling down. And at some point it's actually going to even start changing its colors, first becoming a little bit more like the typical sun today and eventually becoming dimmer and dimmer and then even turning into an object known as the black dwarf. Although all of this we expect to happen in like trillions of years from today. But anyway, enough about what white dwarfs are, there are other videos I made previously that explain this in a little bit more detail. Why are we really talking about this specific white dwarf? Well, it just so happens that very recently the scientists discovered an extremely strange white dwarf somewhere out there that was actually behaving really strangely and had very strange properties. Now you might already know that our sun is one day going to become one as well, very similar to this one. And the thing is, most of the white dwarfs we've discovered so far are usually approximately half to maybe 70% the mass of the sun. Almost none of them are heavier than that. And Sirius B is one of the few exceptions we've seen so far that seems to have a massive white dwarf. But except for the much more massive size, it doesn't really have anything more unusual about it. And the other thing you have to be aware of is that when it comes to white dwarfs, they do have a limit of their mass. If they actually gain a little bit more mass, and here we can demonstrate this with Sirius B, you can see as soon as I give it a little bit more mass, it actually does sort of decrease in size, it becomes more dense. There's going to be a limit that it reaches where it can no longer sustain itself. It basically collapses and explodes. This limit is known as the Chandra Zakar limit, and as you can see, as soon as the white dwarf hits about 1.4 masses of the sun, it instantly explodes as a supernova, and this is what we call type 1 supernova, type 1a supernova to be more specifically. And these supernova are almost always exactly the same, they have very similar brightness, so this is why a lot of scientists today use the supernova as a kind of a measurement device, because their brightness is usually the same, we can use them to establish distances across the universe. And very often this Chandrasekhar limit or the supernova happen when two white dwarfs collide. So for example if there were two progenitor stars and both of them eventually became white dwarfs and then at some point they come too close together they will also produce a supernova very similar to what you've just seen. But it seems that sometimes something else might occur. It appears that sometimes white dwarfs can actually survive the collision and create something a little bit more intriguing. So in this case, as you can see from this image created by Mohamed Naou for his research, the typical white dwarf has this structure. It has a lot of carbon and oxygen on the inside, it also has a helium shell and a hydrogen shell. And carbon and oxygen is here because most of these stars that produce white dwarfs are not massive enough to turn carbon and oxygen into fuel. If however a star is a little bit more massive, it can usually create fuel out of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen and keep going a little bit longer. 
but our sun and also some other stars cannot really do that and so all of the white dwarfs they produce have this very similar structure. This white dwarf however doesn't seem to have this and for some reason you can actually see its carbon pretty easily. In other words it's not inside it's on the outside and the surface of this white dwarf seems to have a lot of carbon with some hydrogen as well so this is a very strange mixture we've never really seen before. At the same time its mass is about double the mass meaning that it's about 1.14 masses of the sun not so far off from the so-called Chandrasekhar limit. And it also seems to move a little bit too fast across the night skies, which is actually how the scientists discovered it to begin with. They were using the data from the beautiful Gaia telescope that has been collecting the motion data for all of the stars um, in the nearby space, and it already has data of approximately 1.2 billion different stars. And so by seeing this unusual motion across the night skies, they noticed that there was a white dwarf that was moving a little bit faster, about 120 kilometers per second faster. And this is also one of the fastest white dwarfs moving across the night skies right now. And it was more massive and had this very, very unusual chemical structure. And so when scientists tried to understand how all of this could have occurred, only one possible solution could explain all of these observations. The white dwarf was very likely a result of a collision between two white dwarfs, but instead of going supernova like you'll see here any second now, these two white dwarfs instead decided to collide into a single object. They did not produce type 1a supernova, they instead produced an extremely interesting mix of two different white dwarfs. They instead mixed their cores, throwing off a lot of other materials, and basically ended up being one single object moving really fast across the night skies. Obviously their mass increased as well, and this would make sense because the mass that we're observing is about double the mass of a typical white dwarf. And because of this observation and also because of this analysis, this also suggests that what we're looking at is one of the older stars in our galaxy because this is what we think may have happened. The original system was probably very similar to the nearby Alpha Centauri, where there are two sun-like stars. Now here I put them on a very close orbit, but in reality they were actually on a really, really far away orbit, probably at least a few astronomical units away from one another. And eventually one of these stars, probably the more massive star, started growing larger and became what's known as a supergiant. And just to give you a bit of a perspective, if our sun is right here, this is what our sun is going to be like later on, in a few billion years. So this is what one of these stars became as well. But let's go back to our miniature model because it's a little bit easier to visualize here. Now eventually the smaller star will actually get kind of swallowed by the larger star and it will start orbiting inside its envelope. But this will not last very long because at some point the larger star will actually expel its outer shell, it will create what's known as a planetary nebula, a lot of which are some of the most beautiful objects in the night sky and will then only leave behind the core, which is essentially the white dwarf. And after a few billion years, this is what the system might look like. We have the white dwarf that's left, and the smaller star that's still there, but is about to enter its giant stage as well. So possibly within a few hundred million years, the second star will now start growing and do the same thing. It will actually cover the white dwarf, which will start orbiting inside of it, and slowly make its way toward the core of the other star. Eventually this star will also disappear, producing another beautiful planetary nebula in the process and we end up in a system of binary dwarfs. And here they are close enough to start producing gravitational waves that will slowly take them closer and closer to one another. And eventually they'll basically be so close that they'll combine and turn into this unusual object. In the process they'll also very likely shift their velocity a lot and this process might take anywhere from 1 to 2 billion years and so the result product we're looking at is approximately 12 to maybe even 13 billion years old. In other words, this unusual, very strangely moving object is one of the first stars in our galaxy that is now a white dwarf and is going to be this for a very, very long time. But there are still a lot of questions about this unusual object, such as, for example, why did it not explode after all? And also, since it's only about 150 light years away from us, if it does explode one day, this is potentially one of those objects that could be somewhat dangerous to be close to, because the supernova here is close enough to cause detrimental effects to the atmosphere of our planet. In other words, this peculiar object produced by two different white dwarfs 
could be one of those objects we need to kind of look at closer. We need to investigate how exactly did it develop? Is it maybe still spinning really fast so that's why it's not exploding? Does it still maybe have a chance to go supernova? And if so, what are the possible implications for our planet? Because normally some objects like neutron stars and certain white dwarfs do not go supernova if they spin really really fast. But stars lose momentum with time and they actually do decrease their spin. And eventually if it starts spinning a lot slower, it might no longer be able to maintain its own mass and thus go supernova. So this peculiar object does actually create a lot of um, intriguing questions we need to try to answer. So trying to understand why this star failed to create a supernova is somewhat important for, I guess, in some sense, our own survival. And that's because there were actually several studies in the past that suggested certain supernova may have affected the climate and the atmosphere of our planet, and we've even seen signs of certain supernova here on the planet by looking at various layers of sediments here on the planet Earth. So in reality, it could be actually white dwarfs and not Betelgeuse that could create the next supernova that we might be able to see from Earth, but hopefully it's not close enough for us to worry about. And here is, by the way, what might happen if one day a white dwarf, such as for example a Sirius B, goes supernova nearby. It might actually affect our atmosphere and create somewhat uninhabitable conditions on planet Earth. Anyway, we'll talk more about supernova and various effects of supernova in some of the future videos, so do subscribe if you still haven't and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Looks like I destroyed Earth once again, but this time completely by accident. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, or maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon and becoming a wonderful person. There are a bunch of t-shirts, hoodies and also pillows available in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out and as always, bye bye.